<laughs> but I, I'd love to hear what's on your minds, what you want to talk about, but I'd like to just maybe, maybe get, get you thinking about uh, where you want to take the discussion by talking about this idea of strategic empathy and its opposite, strategic narcissism. And in, in the book I, I wrote last year, uh, it, I've, I've described strategic narcissism as the tendency to define the world only in relation to us, right? And then to assume that what we do or decide not to do is decisive toward achieving a favorable outcome. Now, I mean, of course, that's a problem because it, it is self-referential and it doesn't grant any, any agency or influence or authorship over the future to others. Others including enemies, adversaries, and rivals. It's a profoundly arrogant way to think about the, the world, if, if you think about it. And what it lacks is this idea of strategic empathy, a term that I borrowed from my friend Zachary Shore, who I recommend reading anything he's written, right? He's written a great book called, uh, called uh, uh, on, uh, gosh, what is it called? Uh, Blunder. Uh, and and the, the subtitle is, you know, Why Smart People Make Dumb Decisions, right? And, and, and what strategic narcissism does, it does, it makes you prone to dumb decisions because it, you, can, you, you can fall into cognitive traps, right? Like optimism bias and, and, and confirmation bias. And so I, I think that's what we're up against you know, today in the world broadly, but especially we see it in dramatic form uh, in, in Afghanistan today. And what we have seen, I think, in today uh, is the result of across many years defining the problem in Afghanistan and in South Asia based on how we might like it to be. And what we have engaged in is an extraordinary degree of self-delusion based on strategic narcissism, right? And what are the elements of that delusion that we're seeing playing out today, right? For, first of all, uh, this, this idea, right, this, uh, this idea that the Taliban would share power. I mean, really? This is how we, it, this is the, the premise that we, that we used across now you know, three administrations for negotiating with, with the Taliban. All you had to do is, is read what, what they say what they write in their weekly newspaper, right? Um, the second element of delusion is that there was this bold line, this bold line between the Taliban, you know, and other jihadist terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda. And the reality is, and this is demonstrably the, you know, the case, is that these groups are utterly intertwined. And they exist in a terrorist ecosystem uh, around the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, border area in which these organizations share people. They share resources and expertise and, 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 uh, and, and this idea that there's a bold line is, is, complete, is complete fantasy, right? You know, a third element of that delusion was that, you know, the Taliban, maybe they'll be more benign, you know, this time, right? It'll be, it'll be a more enlightened, you know, uh, form of Sharia that they'll impose uh, on, 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 uh, on Afghans. And, and, and this is the height of, of self-delusion. And, and of course, we would know that just by looking at what they did in areas that they controlled before this major offensive. And, uh, and so what we're seeing now are, is Afghans paying the price, right, for, you know, for our self-delusion uh, and, uh, and, and strategic narcissism, not really understanding the nature uh, of, uh, of the enemies uh, who were, we were fighting. And so, so uh, what, what, do, what, do we, what do we do now? Right? I think we really are at a point in time where we have to do something to improve our strategic competence. We have been pursuing foreign policy and national security in ways that are utterly incompetent, you know, based on this tendency towards strategic narcissism. And we've seen that based on these flawed assumptions, the ones I mentioned about Afghanistan, but flawed assumptions, I think, that underpin many of our policies and strategies. I mean, if you think about it, the, the talk I prepared and that I'll send to you was mainly about China and, and how we clung to the, to, the, to the flawed assumption that China, having been welcomed into the international order, right, would, would play by the rules. And as China prospered, you know, it would, it would, it, it would, it would liberalize its economy uh, and its form of government, right? And, and based on that, on, that, uh, on that flawed assumption, we, we pursued a strategy of you know, cooperation and engagement with China rather than one of c competition. Are you going to write a dereliction of duty, too, um, about the current situation? Um, that's a sarcastic version. But I am curious, do you see any of the same patterns that you addressed yeah. in that book um, yeah. applying to our current yeah. tragedy today? Yeah, I, I do. I do see you know, I do see parallels. Right. So as a historian, you have to always say that, you know, that that analogies are imperfect, right, between different, between, uh, d you know, different events and circumstances and outcomes, you know, because of the complex interaction, you know, of, of people and, and events and, and, uh, and the uniqueness of historical events broadly. 
but I do I do see patterns that that emerge really from the the failure uh, in 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 Vietnam and the failure in in the long wars you know of of uh, you know the 9/11 wars uh, in Afghanistan and, and in Iraq, and uh, and I write about that in Battlegrounds right. So so there's there are two chapters on Afghanistan, and then in the conclusion, what I, what I try to do is to draw from the the lessons that I, I took out of the opportunity to research and and write about how and why Vietnam became an American war and how I believe that those, you know, th those observations ap apply to today, right? And, and I just tell the story of going into the White House quite unexpectedly as National Security Advisor in February of 2017 and that surreal feeling of walking into, you know, McGeorge Bundy's office, right? The National Security Advisor uh, during the Lyndon Johnson administration, Kennedy, and then, and then the, the first years of the, of the Johnson administration. Uh, and, 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 and recognizing that now I was in charge of the national security and foreign policy decision-making process that I had criticized, right, as, as, from the perspective as a historian. And so I resolved, okay, well, I should at least do my best to not make the same mistakes, right, as I criticized McGeorge Bundy and, and, and Lyndon Johnson and his senior military and civilian advisors. So what were those lessons? And to get to your question, what, what do I see as, as the parallels? Well, you know, for, first, first of all, uh, in, in the decisions that led to an American war in Vietnam, uh, President Lyndon Johnson and his principal advisors didn't spend enough time thinking about the nature of the problem, right? The nature of the challenge, right? Uh, and, and that was mainly because Lyndon Johnson viewed Vietnam primarily as a danger to his domestic political agenda, right? And he wanted a strategy for Vietnam that would, that would allow him to escape making a difficult choice between war and disengagement in Vietnam, right? A decision that could alienate key constituencies who were critical to his election in his own right in 1964. Remember, John F. Kennedy's assassinated in, in, in November of 1963. Johnson is, is obsessed, you know, with, with getting elected in his own right. And then to pass the Great Society legislation in 1965. So he viewed Vietnam principally as a danger to those goals. And so instead of talking about, hey, what is the nature of the challenge? What is at stake here? What should our objectives be? You know, the, the discussion was about what can we do, right, without eliciting a big debate, right, and, and, and divisions about the policy that, that could you know, redound to his disbenefit, right, in, in, in the election year uh, and then into 1965. So I, I decided, okay, what can we do about that? Well, we can, we can put into place a process that forces us to frame problems and challenges to national security, right? And, and apply design thinking, essentially, to the first order challenges. So the first thing that I did as national security advisor is I came up with 16 first order challenges. And then we staffed these around to the departments and agencies, but they were posed in a form of a, of a question, right? How to stabilize Iraq and ensure that Iraq is not al aligned with Iran, right? You know, how, how to, you know, how to, uh, you know, how to defeat uh, the Taliban uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan, and, and put, you know, put Afghanistan on a, on a slow path to self-sufficiency and, and sustainable security there. Um, and, uh, and so these first order challenges then became kind of the, 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 you know, the priorities for the administration. And then what we put into place was kind of a, a, new, a new meeting, I think an unprecedented meeting for the, for the Principals Committee of the National Security Council, uh, which was a, a principal small group framing session. And we, we asked our NSC staff to, to work with the departments and agencies to craft a five-page framing paper, which my students here at, uh, at uh, the Master's in International Policy class get to do, <laughs> to do these papers, uh, which, which is to really you know, just define the nature of this challenge on its own terms, right? And then, and then to identify vital interests that are at stake. So what? Why do Americans care about this? Why should the president care about this challenge? And then to view that challenge through the lens of those vital interests, and then craft overarching and our overarching goal, and then more specific objectives. Then, what's critical, and a step that is often skipped, is to make some assumptions, and in particular, identify assumptions concerning the degree to which we believe we have agency. We being the United States and like-minded partners, agency and influence over this complex challenge, and then to identify obstacles to progress. Hey, what's keeping us? from getting to where we are now to, to those goal, to that objective state, right? That, that are described by those objectives. And then, and then what are the opportunities? What are the opportunities that we could exploit, right? We and like-minded partners could exploit. And then just stop, we just stop, the paper just stopped there. And then as we got together the President's cabinet, you know, Secretary of State and Defense and, and, uh, and other you know, heads of departments and, and agencies, we just discussed the framing. Is this right? Do we have this right? And that discussion went on typically for about 30 minutes of the meeting. 
And then we had the policy coordinating committee. These are the assistant secretary level across the departments listening to that, you know, and, and taking notes. This is something that doesn't happen in Washington, right? This is top down guidance, right, from the principal's committee. Typically what you get in Washington is bottom up, right? And it's bottom up. And when you have bottom up, what happens? Satisficing behavior, lowest common denominator approaches to problems. And what you get is policy pablum, right? And you get the result, you know, this, this, it's a result from meetings that begin with like Iran discuss, right? There's no framing. So this framing session was guidance to the, to, to the, to the, to the policy coordinating committee. And then the second part of the meeting was, hey, what are your ideas about how to integrate all elements of national power and efforts of like-minded partners to overcome the obstacles to progress and take advantage of the opportunities, right? Now you have cabinet level officials saying, I think we can do this diplomatically. And the, if you're the Secretary of State, and then the Secretary of the Treasury is saying, well, if you do that, I think we could impose sanctions on these entities that, that, that could reinforce the diplomatic effort. And then you could have commerce saying that if we're going to compete more effectively with China, we have to reinvigorate CFIUS, uh, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States. And we need to reverse CFIUS to look at U.S. investment in Chinese companies. You know, that are trying to gain a differential advantage over us from a security perspective uh, or an unfair advantage economically. So you get the idea of like the, the kind of richness of the discussion you can get just by asking people, right? What are your ideas? And then when, when we had that framing done, I would bring it to the president right after that framing session and say, hey, Mr. President, here is the, here's where, how we see the problem. This is what I think our goals and objectives ought to be. And then he invariably approved that. And then we sent it out as a cabinet memo to begin to turn the ship and then to develop, importantly, multiple options for the president. So what did I say we learned about you know, Vietnam, right? Was, hey, they didn't spend enough time thinking about the nature of the problem. Second is, hey, <laughs> there were no goals and objectives that were clearly understood and, and, and commonly accepted. I mean, George Bundy actually said, hey, it's better not to have an objective in Vietnam because that way, if we don't accomplish it, we can always say, oh, we never wanted to do that anyway. And it can, and it can, give, and it can give the president more flexibility in the domestic political realm. Now, he's saying this about matters of really, of war and life and death, right? Uh, and, and, um, and so the, the, and the third, the third you know, one, of the, one of the other you know, observations I made about this period of time is that the president's advisors listened to what Lyndon Johnson wanted and they gave him exactly what he wanted, right? Which was an option that allowed him to escape a difficult choice on Vietnam. This was the, the strategy of graduated pressure. By the way, which all of the president's military advisors knew was, was going to be an utter failure. They ran two war games on it in 1964 that ended in 1968. This is 1964, they ran the war games. With 500,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam, you know, no, no prospect for success, and the American public losing faith in the war effort and protesting for a U.S. withdrawal. Huh, you know? I mean, it's exactly what happened, right? But, but instead of paying attention to that kind of analysis and advice, he stuck with the one option that they gave him, the option he wanted. So I insisted that we would always present the president with multiple options. And it's, it would be through the comparison of those options that we would address really a fourth, uh, a fourth failure in Vietnam, which was to, to consider the long-term costs and consequences. Okay, what the heck happens next, right? And. Uh, and, and this is also the, one of the main conclusions in a great book by Peter Rodman, which I recommend to you, uh, called Presidential Command, right? I think it's Presidential Command, yeah. And, and, uh, and, in, and in it, he, he talks about how some of the worst you know, blunders in foreign policy and national security occur because of this drive to just give one option to the president. Now, another reason to do that is because, you know, who else got elected? You know, I mean, when I, when I chaired the Principals Committee of the National Security Council, if the president was not in the room, nobody in that room got elected by the American people, right? So it was our job to give the president options, the person who got elected, because he's the one who's accountable to the American people. And if we believe that sovereignty lies with the American people, the radical idea of our revolution, we should at least do our part not to subvert that sovereignty of the people and to give the president options.